desire trout waters. In this crystal clear, icy cold habitat, the trout lives out its existence, its life regulated by the currents, by natural phenomena, by competition with its peers, and by fear, all articulated by a constant search for food. For the trout, this search is focused to a large extent on one source, insects, found on the riverbed or on the surface, often obliging the fish to venture into a dimension in which it does not belong. The insects in question are usually ephemery, but on this occasion we will be taking a look at nymphs, or rather the aquatic phase of river insects. We will also be doing some serious fishing, with nymphs of course. Once the fish has been tempted with an artificial imitation of an insect on which it feeds, or is presumably feeding below the surface, the next step is to encourage it to strike. If Marriott and Halford can be considered the fathers of dry fly fishing, the two people who have contributed more than any others to the development of fishing with nymphs are G.E.M. Skews and Frank Sawyer. Fishing with nymphs can be practiced in many different ways, including upstream sight fishing, that is, casting to a specific fish that lies upstream. Or downstream fishing, casting at a specific fish with a leeson ring lift, as the Americans call it. Or by using the traditional submerger technique, casting the fly where experience suggests the fish will be. Since as far back as the turn of the century, this latter technique has met with the disdain of so-called purists. And yet, fishing with nymphs can in many cases be more demanding than dry fly fishing. Let's say there are two dimensions to dry fly fishing and three to fishing with nymphs, since the latter involves not only length and breadth, but also depth. And this makes weight a very necessary element. Since it is impossible to provide answers to all your questions, we will concentrate on the materials and techniques needed to tie a number of artificial flies and then show how to fish with them. Just a small window onto the immensely varied world of artificial flies, from dry flies to nymphs, caddis flies, and stone flies. From streamers to poppers. This is our workbench with its array of traditional equipment and an amazingly diverse selection of materials. The vise, scissors, whip finishing tools, hackle pliers. Bobbin holders, ready for use with tying thread in various colors. We will show how to use the materials as we go along, revealing the secrets of copper and lead wire. Innovative polyfloss. Natural furs. Plumage. The classic poly. The versatile new dub, and of course, hooks in different shapes and sizes. Each element has its own characteristics and a series of possible uses. This is the fastest and most efficient way to flatten the barb of a hook. By the way, the Tiemco range of hooks has tiny barbs and many models are actually made without them. While we're on the subject, I think that nowadays it is almost universally accepted that barbless hooks make it much easier to release a fish once it's caught. If you don't want to use the vise, or if you have to flatten out the barb on the riverbank, make sure you have a pair of flat-nosed pliers handy. The material used for the holder of these bobbins makes it impossible for the tying thread to break while in use. Older type bobbin holders tend to cause fraying because the thread is constantly rubbing against the end of the holder. 
to stop this happening, an ingenious modification now allows the thread to run straight out of the end of the holder. This all but eliminates the risk of fraying and at the same time the holder is much easier to use. The pheasant tail is an imitation of the tiny nymphs of ephemerae of either the Betidae or Ephemeralidae families. As the name suggests, the material used is fibers taken from pheasant tail feathers. These can be found in various shades, dark, light or dyed. For this nymph, we will use darker feathers from a male pheasant and we will substitute the usual tying thread with thin copper wire to add weight to our imitation. This is the dressing originally created by Frank Sawyer, a well-known water bailiff on the River Avon in Hampshire and one of the fathers of fishing with nymphs. To start with, make a ball with the copper wire to simulate the nymph's thorax. Wind on the wire evenly, taking great care to avoid twisting it because that might cause it to break. Then wind on the wire in tight spirals up to where the hook starts to curve. Now Take a few fibers from the pheasant feather. Five or six are enough. Like this. Place them on the hook. And tie them in with a couple of winds of the wire. A word of warning. Contrary to the usual procedure, the wire should not be immediately wound back towards the eye. That is the point where the rest of the tied-in material ends. Instead, using the hackle pliers, start to wind on the fibers in tight spirals, twisting them as you go. Once the body is complete, wind on the wire again, this time in wide spirals, as far as the thorax. In this way, the fibers will be tied in to create the nymph's ribbing. Once the fibers are in place, cut away the surplus. The nymph's thorax is also made from pheasant fibers. Make sure they are tied in tip forward both behind the copper wire ball and close to the eye of the hook. Cut off the surplus. Then, in the same way that the abdomen was made, use hackle pliers to twist the fibers and wind them on in tight spirals to cover the copper wire ball continuing up to the eye of the hook. Now, Tie in the fibers with a couple of winds, making sure that they end up on top. Then wind on the copper wire in wide spirals up to where the thorax begins. After bending the fibers back to simulate the nymph's wing cases, tie them in and then 
tie off the dressing using the whip finishing tool. After cutting the wire and snipping off the surplus, the nymph is ready for use. Frank Sawyer believed in using a limited number of imitations and used to divide his flies into dark and light models. The dark ones like the pheasant tail, the light ones like the gray goose, which as its name suggests is made with fibers taken from the feathers of the gray goose. A more recent variation is made from pheasant fibers dyed olive green. This is squirrel's fur dyed in various colors. This nymph requires two shades of green, the lightest for the abdomen and the darkest for the thorax. Set up the tying thread and wind it on in tight spirals almost to the curve of the hook. Cut off the surplus and add a few more spirals. Then tie in the tail using, in this case, pheasant tail fibers. Four or five are enough. And once tied in, they must not exceed the length of the shank. Cut away the surplus, and then add a piece of round gold tinsel. Tie it in with four or five winds of thread. After cutting away the excess again, apply a thin coating of wax to the thread. This will make it easier to tie in the dubbing material. In this case, squirrel's fur dyed olive green. Squirrel's fur with its soft, fairly long fibers is an ideal material for making nymphs and emerges. A good percentage of underhair gives it excellent water retention qualities. This not only weighs down the fly, but it also moves a lot underwater and consequently becomes more alluring. Now use the hackle pliers to make the ribbing by winding on the tinsel in wide, even spirals in the opposite direction to the main dressing. Then tie in the tinsel with a few tight winds of thread and cut off the surplus. One of the best materials for making nymph wing cases is pheasant feather fibers. Select some and place them on the hook where the end of the thread is. Make sure they are well tied in at the base by repeatedly winding on the thread as tightly as possible. For the thorax, use a darker shade of olive green squirrel's fur. Apply to the thread more material than was used for the abdomen. Make sure the dubbing is fluffier this time, so that when tied in, it will make not only the nymph's thorax, but also its feet.
After tying in the dubbing, wind the thread up to the eye. Now bend the pheasant fibers forward and tie them in with tight consecutive winds, making sure to cover as much of the fibers as possible, not only to secure them firmly, but also to create the head of your imitation. Snip away the surplus and then tie off using the whip finisher to make a couple of tight knots. The first knot. Now the second one. Cut off the tying thread. A final adjustment. and the nymph is finished. Notice how, especially when seen from above, the completed imitation actually does look like a tiny ephemera nymph. And now let's take a look at a couple of possible variations. In a previous tape, we made the acquaintance of that extraordinary fly, the gold-ribbed hare ear, which in its classic English version is an imitation of a floating nymph of the Betidae family. In the United States, on the other hand, the GRHE is used as a nymph in the real sense of the word. In place of the thick butt, which aids flotation, the American version concentrates on the wing cases using the method described previously. Then, after the pheasant feather fibers have been tied in, shavings of hare's fur are used to make the thorax and legs. Choose a few tufts of fur and underhair and pull out several longer hairs. After mixing everything together, wax the tying thread well and apply the dubbing. As in the English version, the thorax made from fluffy, unsquashed dubbing will be soft and voluminous. Now bend forward the pheasant feather fibers to simulate the nymph's wing cases. After tying them in, cut off the surplus and then tie off the imitation using the whip finishing tool. Another knot for safety. And there we are. As a finishing touch, using the special comb, extend the longest hairs to represent the legs. And this is what the final result will look like. The material in this convenient dispenser case is poly. This is only a small selection of the wide range of colors on the market. The advantage of this packaging system is that the amount of material needed is right there, and at the same time all the shades available are easily visible. Apply a little poly to a hook on which a tail made with a tuft of cock's feather fibers dyed olive green and a length of medium-sized copper wire have already been tied in. <laughs> 
In this case, contrary to the usual procedure for dry flies, the poly must not be delicately wrapped around the tying thread. In fact, the more there is, as long as it is well compressed, the greater this imitation's capacity to absorb and retain water. After the poly has been tied in, use hackle pliers to make ribbing with the copper wire, which has three specific functions. One, it adds weight. Two, it creates a more solid body. And three, it makes the nymph glint underwater. To make the wing cases, use pheasant fibers again. Tie them in, as before, close to their base, with a series of tight consecutive winds. Make sure they are well secured, and cut off the surplus. These are partridge feathers. Partridge is very popular material for both dry flies and wet flies or nymphs. In this case, use a partridge feather to make the legs. After cleaning off all the down at the base of the quill, choose the required section and open up the fibers by combing them the wrong way. Tie the feather in from the tip, just in front of the thorax. Snip off the surplus. And then it's time to start work on the thorax. In contrast to the preceding case, the dubbing material must not be too fluffy when applied to the thread, since the legs will not be formed by the longer hairs, but by the soft, flexible partridge feather fibers, which are ideal for the job. After tying in, Bend the partridge feather forward and tie the quill in immediately behind the eye. Then arrange the feather on the back of the nymph, making sure it is well centered. And cut off the surplus. Next, bend forward the pheasant fibers to cover everything else and tie them in. Cut away the excess and finish the job with a whip finisher. This nymph can be tied with either synthetic or natural material. In both cases, it makes an excellent imitation and is extremely alluring. As we said at the beginning, the two leading lights of nymph fishing are skews and sawyer. No less expert than Halford, the father of dry fly fishing, with whom he had some memorable differences of opinion, it was Skews who developed the technique of upstream fishing with nymphs. The trick is to cast a nymph imitation directly upstream from a trout swimming in the current, and let it sink to the same depth as it drifts downstream towards the fish. Sawyer championed a different approach. He believed that the fly did not have to be a perfect imitation of a nymph, but just had to behave like one. In other words, his technique was to cast a weighted nymph upstream from a trout swimming in the current. When the nymph drifts down level with the trout, the tip of the rod is lifted. 
The nymph is jerked up as it passes in front of the fish, which strikes at it instinctively. This is known as the induced take technique. This is a hen's skin. Take a feather from the lower part of the neck and clean off all the downy, fragile fibers around the quill. The feather will serve to make the hackle of an emerging nymph. Tie in the feather sideways on, right behind the eye of a hook on which a body with copper wire ribbing has already been made. The nymph's tail will be made by a tuft of fibers taken from a feather of the same hen. Cut off the excess part of the quill and tie in the fibers. While doing this, use the left hand to push back the fibers during each wind and before the next one. This has to be done because, unlike cock fibers, hen fibers are soft and difficult to tie in evenly, and also because the feather has been placed on a section of the hook where the dressing already completed is slightly cone-shaped from the beginning of the body to the eye. After tying in the hackle and cutting off the surplus, Wind on more thread to create the head. Taking care at every wind to push back all the fibers to represent the insect's legs and wings as though they were still folded. This kind of nymph reflects the concept of the classic submerged fly and is very similar to the first nymphs tied by GEM skews. As far as their use goes, Medium small ones are ideal for traditional fishing with submerged flies, for sight fishing and for upstream fishing. While those tied on medium large hooks are good for fishing in reservoirs or lakes, especially when used with a floating line and long leader and wound in slowly. Yes, this one is really an all-round fly. Even though it appeared on the fly tying scene only a few years ago, new dub was quickly accepted as a classic material. As versatile as its cousin, micro chenille, it makes possible some very imaginative and fast tying techniques, and its strength and imitative qualities are quite extraordinary. Using new dub for tying body flies or twisting a single solid color piece around the hook shank are both well-tried techniques. But for our emerging nymph, we will twist together two sections of new dub, each a different color. After tying both sections tightly onto the shank with several winds of thread, start to twist them like this, to create a single braid with alternating colors. The next step is to wind the braid onto the shank until it meets the tying thread. With every wind, keep twisting the two sections so that the desired effect will be the same for the whole length of the body. When it gets close to the eye, tie in the new dub with a few tight winds of thread. And snip off the excess.
A small hen's hackle completes this simple but very effective imitation. New dub is also an ideal material for ribbing. In this case, to thicken the body of another emerger made from squirrel's fur dubbing. Wind the new dub on in the opposite direction to the main body. A few tight winds of thread are enough to guarantee a simple, robust structure. Cut away the excess. Add the usual hen's hackle. And the little emerger is finished. The best way to fish with emerger nymphs like the ones described so far is to use Sue's method with or without Sawyer's refinement. In this case, the imitation cast upstream floated down with the current and was taken by a trout swimming just below the surface. Although it is not a big trout, it is capable of unexpected bursts of speed as soon as it is hooked and has considerable reserves of energy. It is therefore advisable to land the fish as quickly as possible in order to avoid harming it. As usual, once the brief struggle is won, the fish is released. The very dark color of the wing cases is the most important of many indications that this little nymph is close to hatching. A col de canard feather will serve to keep this tiny imitation just below the surface, exactly like a little ephemera moments before it passes to the done stage. The cul de canard feather, tied in, in this case according to the iris method, will not only keep the nymph afloat, it also serves to imitate the fly's wing cases with the newly formed wings already visible. Tie in the feather at the tip, and then make the thorax using squirrel's fur dubbing, the same that has already been used for the body, but using a darker shade. An ephemeral's thorax is always darker than the rest of the body. When applied to the tying thread and when it is being wound on, this dubbing should always be a little fluffy, never too compact, since the residue will serve to imitate the insect's feet. Now bend back the cul de canard feather and tie it in tightly next to the eye. Snip away the excess, and then finish the little floating nymph with the usual knot. This system works just as well on a much larger scale, since the Col de Canard's capacity to float is more than enough to support these imitations. The way these nymphs sit in the water depends on the weight of the dressing and the position of the Col de Canard feather. In this case, the feather is tied in very close to the eye and easily supports a good-sized nymph. In America, Polly is a popular substitute for Col de Canard. After building the nymph's body in the usual ways, apply a tuft of dark poly to the tying thread. Don't use wax in this case in order not to weigh down the imitation. Start with the thread above the imitation and squeeze the poly into a ball on the nymph's back. Winding the thread back onto the shank requires great care and should leave the poly soft and fluffy since it must perform the same job as the col de canard feather. To create the nymph's feet, use fibers taken from a cock's feather. In this case, they are dyed olive green. 
Tie in two little tufts on each side of the ball with the tips spread, facing backwards and slightly down. Apply the fibers one side at a time and tie them in behind and in front of the wing case. These rockers not only improve the imitation effect, they are essential to balance the nymph in the water. Repeat the same procedure with the second tuft of fibers, taking care that when tied in, it is the same length and at the same angle as the other one. Cut away the surplus. And then tie the thorax using poly. After applying the dubbing evenly on the tying thread, wind it on behind and in front of the poly ball. ending up right behind the eye of the hook. Then complete the fly as usual with the whip finishing tool. This type of nymph is very effective, but it will not float as long as ones made from Col de Canard. Even so, it sits perfectly in the water. The air caught in the poly keeps it afloat and at the same time acts as an irresistible lure for trout, since it lets off little bubbles like the ones produced by ephemery to keep them afloat while hatching. Balls of polystyrene and a piece of a woman's stocking are ideal materials for making the wing cases of another small nymph. After trapping one of the balls in the material using the stocking's elasticity, place it on the hook on which the abdomen has already been tied. And tie it in tightly, keeping the material taut all the time. It is important to tie in as much of the stocking as possible so that the ball will be fixed tightly to the shank. Then cut away the surplus part of the stocking. To make the thorax, use animal fur dubbing, in this case, squirrel's fur. Apply it to the tying thread and then tie it behind and in front of the polystyrene ball. Now complete the fly with a couple of knots using the whip finisher. The wing cases of nymphs about to hatch are very dark in color. To achieve this effect, use an indelible marker, making sure to color the ball completely. The easiest way to do this is to use a vise which gives 360 degrees rotation. Apparently the idea to use a piece of nylon netting to contain semi-floatable material came from Charles Brooks, one of America's most famous anglers. But the first suspender nymphs using closed cell materials like ethafoam and polystyrene were created by English anglers Brian Clark and John Goddard, who were both expert fly tires. Of the three methods of tying floating nymphs that we've dealt with so far, this is undoubtedly the most effective. The reason is simple. No matter how deep the nymph is pulled under by the current, it will always try to float back up.
In fact, as it rises to the surface, it is at its most alluring, the perfect imitation of a nymph in the hatching stage. This phase of the insect's development, imitated with emergers, precedes its transition to the done stage. The final stage, when the ephemera has completely emerged and is drying its wings before flying away, is imitated with a dry fly. In fairly shallow water, the obvious choice is to use dry flies. But the little nymphs described above, and in particular the ones with cul de canard and the polystyrene ball, can give excellent results, especially when the fish stay well below the surface and refuse to strike at anything. Even a nymph with a little weight to it can get good results. Try letting it slip over the rocks with the current and then lift it gently with the tip of the rod at the end of the pool. In waters like this, especially in the middle of the day when the weather is hot, a nymph is probably the best choice. In stretches where the pools are deeper, try using a weighted nymph. For example, this brown trout with its almost golden scales could not resist the temptation. Polyflus is a new material which is destined to revolutionize fly tying. It is sold in a fluffy, elastic thread and comes in an almost unlimited range of colors. Formed by an infinite number of hair-like fibers, it can be incredibly fluffy, but under pressure, it is as strong as the strongest tying thread. When applied like ordinary thread, it is almost immediately apparent that a good part of the shank can be covered with a single wind. If the next step involves using dubbing, just pare away 60 to 70 percent of the thread. Bunch it up on the remaining section and keep winding until the desired effect is achieved. The fibers that remain are amazingly strong and quite sufficient to complete the fly. Some think that polyflus is best used for dry flies, but it offers countless possibilities for tying nymphs too. Polyflus is also particularly useful for tying small larvae. Begin by winding the thread tightly onto the shank and then add dubbing using the method described previously. Tie in the dubbing almost up to the eye of the hook. Then carry on with a second bobbin holder loaded with the same material but in a different color. Use the first few winds to tie in not only the new thread but also the previous one. And then cut away the excess and eliminate the first bobbin holder. Repeat the same procedure with the new color. Pare away most of the polyfloss fibers. Bunch them up on the remaining section and then wind on this dubbing to make the part next to the head.
Tie it off well with the whip finisher and the fly is complete. Now, let's see how to make a nymph with polyfloss. Tie in at the curve of the hook a few fibers of elk fur. At this stage of tying, the polyfloss is used as ordinary tying thread. Add a section of the same material but of a contrasting color in order to make the ribbing. Then, use the main thread to tie the nymph's body, winding the thread on at the same spot several times in order to achieve a conical effect. Now, add the ribbing by winding on the contrasting color thread in wide spirals and in the opposite direction to the main thread. Tie it in. And cut off the surplus. For the wing cases, use fibers taken from a cock pheasant feather. Tie them in at the beginning of the abdomen on the lower end with a series of tight spirals. Now use a cock feather to create the insect's feet. After cleaning off the base, Tie in the feather right next to the pheasant fibers. Cut away the excess and then use the polyfloss thread to make the thorax. A few wines are enough. After winding on the hackle, bend the pheasant fibers forward and tie them in tightly next to the eye. Make sure that the thread is now wound on towards the back in order to tie in the largest possible amount of fibers. Cut away the surplus, a last minute adjustment, then use the whip finisher, and this is how the finished nymph should look. This transparent plastic tubing comes in various lengths and in a wide range of colors. The most important thing about liquid lace is that it is very strong and very elastic. And this makes it one of the best materials available for making the bodies of larvae or the abdomens of nymphs, ephemerae, and stoneflies. In order to make a chironomid larva full of hemoglobin, use a section of bright red lace and a grub hook. Wind the lace onto the hook in tight spirals, at the same time stretching it to make it as flat as possible. The tying thread must also be red.
since the transparency of liquid lace makes it change color according to the color of the material it is wound around. At the foot of the eye, tie in the lace with several tight winds of thread. The pliability and elasticity of the lace facilitates this operation. The thread bites into the lace and fastens it tightly without increasing the size of the lava. After snipping off the excess, the lava is virtually complete, or requires only a little dubbing on the head as a finishing touch. Liquid lace works well with many other materials, in this case, polyfloss. Cut off a fairly large section of white polyfloss and then double it to increase its volume. This will serve as the breathing filaments of a mosquito lava. Apply the polyfloss to a grub hook already dressed with red liquid lace tied in over a base of black thread. Tie it in with a few winds, then cut off the part turned back towards the abdomen. Next, using the whip finisher, tie and cut off the black thread. For the next step, use brown polyfloss. Tie it in as usual, and then make a dubbing to create the thorax. Cut away most of the polyfloss fibers. Bunch them up on the part that remains and tie them in. Almost all the dubbing should be concentrated behind the head tufts, with just a couple of winds in front. In this way, the tying thread will end up right behind the hook eye, where it must be tied off with the whip finisher. Remove any excess fibers. And after adjusting the head tufts, the lava is finished. A good way to add weight to nymphs and larvae made with liquid lace is to use copper or lead wire. Tie a section of yellow liquid lace with a piece of thick copper wire inserted inside it onto a grub hook. Then start winding it on in tight spirals. The use of copper instead of lead depends on how much the imitation must be weighted and on the need to give it a more metallic or a more golden glint. While winding on the liquid lace, decide whether it is better to keep it stretched for each spiral or to leave a certain amount of space between the inner walls and the copper wire. Since liquid lace comes in a wide range of dimensions, from superfine to large, it can be used on hooks of all sizes. After covering the whole shank, tie in the liquid lace. Cut off the excess and finish off the lava with some dubbing near the eye. To tie larvae on very small hooks, slide the liquid lace directly onto the shank like a sleeve. Then choose a tying thread in a contrasting color and tie in the ribbing that will imitate abdominal rings. <laughs> 
The result, as you can see, is very satisfactory. The use of metal beads to add weight to a nymph is an Austrian contribution to fly fishing. In order to tie one of these pierced beads onto a large hook, the first step is to have a base to support it. In this case, thread it onto a section of nylon fishing line and burn the end with a lighter to make a bump so the bead will not slide off. Place the bead at the head of the imitation and tie in the nylon line tightly for quite a way so that it will not come loose. These pierced beads are usually made of metal and can be found in gold, silver and mother of pearl. Golden beads are usually made of brass. Plastic ones can also be found, but they are no good for adding weight to an imitation. Make the tail of the nymph with fibers taken from a hen pheasant feather. The color is lighter than that of the cock. Place the fibers on the hook just before it begins to curve and tie it in with a few tight winds. Snip off the surplus. And then add a piece of medium-sized copper wire to simulate the nymph's ribbing. Tie the wire in with several winds. Then, using a lavish amount of tying wax, prepare the dubbing for the body. In this case, the material is a synthetic substitute for seal fur rust-colored, wiry, and crinkly at the same time. When applying the dubbing to the tying thread, make sure it is compressed as much as possible, because this material has a natural tendency to fluff out. After the dubbing is tied in, make the nymph's ribbing with the copper wire, winding it on in wide spirals, but this time in the same direction as the tying thread. The gold bead has the double function of adding considerable weight, at the same time reproducing the air bubble that forms when the nymph is about to go through its last hatching stage. After finishing the ribbing, Tie in the copper wire. Cut off the excess part and tie off. This kind of imitation is particularly suitable for catching rainbow trout, for which the light glinting off the golden bead seems to have a special attraction. Gold beads, peacock, and partridge fibers. These are the materials for the next nymph. This time, the size of the hook makes it possible to insert the bead directly onto the shank. The tail will be made with fibers taken from a partridge feather. The body will require several hurls taken from the tail feathers of a peacock.
Place four or five of these hurls point first right in front of the tail and tie them in along most of the shank. After cutting away the surplus, wind the hurls on towards the eye, at the same time twisting them to form a tight cord that, when this phase is complete, should cover two-thirds of the shank. After the hurls have been wound on, tie them in and snip off the excess. To make the wing case, use the pheasant fibers, positioning them base first and tying them in at the lower end of the body. Cut away the surplus fibers, taking care to clean away all the residue in this section. Then tie off with the whip finisher and cut the tying thread. In this case, in fact, the bead is not the nymph's head, but its thorax. Position the bead on the shank, and then continue the construction of the nymph, starting with the thread in front of the bead. Select a partridge feather. Clean away all the down at the lower end, and tie it in in front of the bead sideways on, with the concave side facing away from the eye, so that the fibers tend to naturally bend towards the tail. Cut away the excess. Then use hackle pliers to wind on the feather, taking care with every wind to pull the fibers towards the tail with your free hand. As you can see, the feather does not have a lot to offer and must therefore be arranged as well as possible. After snipping away what little excess there is, spread out the partridge fibers. Now bend forward the pheasant feather fibers. Tie them in with a few very tight winds. and finish up by working the partridge fibers as much under the imitation as possible. Cut away the excess, and with several winds of thread, make the nymph's head, which should be quite large. I learned how to tie this nymph from my friend Giuliano Massetti, who is not only an expert angler, but also a highly imaginative creator of imitations. I have found this particular example to be extremely effective in all waters, especially on medium to large hooks.
This, on the other hand, is a more traditional example of this tying technique, particularly popular with Austrian anglers who use it to imitate a caddis pupa. The advantage of the imitations just described is that they sink very quickly. The repeated mending by Piero, our guest angler, as he tries to hook a particularly stubborn trout, is not, as in dry fly fishing, to prevent dragging, but to drop it into the water so that it sinks more quickly. The trout continues to feed on insects that float past it in the current. Piero knows the fish will strike close to the surface, and he tries to get the nymph to sink as deep as possible before flipping it up with the tip of the rod. A cast too short. Short again. And then the fish strikes, and the fight is on. Even though the trout puts up quite a struggle, it is no match for the angler in spite of the line's low breaking strain. A good sized fish. Like all true anglers, Piero admires the coloring of his catch and then releases it. let's take a look at the easiest and most effective way to add weight to an imitation. It's possible to buy pre-prepared hooks. And these nymphs require the use of soft metal wire of various gauges, usually copper or lead. In order to make sure the nymph sinks quickly, lead is obviously the preferred material. Cut a piece of lead wire. Tie one end onto the hook close to the eye and then wind the wire onto the shank in tight spirals. It's advisable to make sure that the added weight is positioned slightly towards the head of the nymph, not only to give it better balance in the water, but also because the added thickness around the thorax area improves the nymph's outline from below. The right amount of lead is achieved either by several winds of small gauge wire or fewer winds of larger gauge wire. After the wire has been wound on, snip off the excess part and then tie in the added weight with wide spirals of tying thread which will guarantee the stability of the completed dressing by preventing the lead wire from revolving on the shank. Keep winding on the thread up to the curve of the hook in tight spirals in order to create a rough surface for the nymph's dressing. Use elk's fur for the tail, making sure to choose a section with very fine hair. Take a small tuft, clean off any residue or down around the base. Tie it in, initially sloping slightly downwards. and then use wider spirals to tie it in along the shank. Cut away the excess level with the beginning of the lead spiral. 
use a piece of green medium gauge liquid lace to make the ribbing and tie it in the same way as the elk's fur. To make the nymph's body, use animal fur new dub, which, like its synthetic equivalent, is amazingly strong. Tie in one end near the nymph's tail, and then wind on the thread the length of the body. While winding on the new dub, keep it constantly stretched to make sure it fits securely onto the shank. After arriving at the point reached by the tying thread, tie in the new dub, but do not cut off the excess. Continue the ribbing by winding on the liquid lace, keeping it well stretched to make it thinner and at the same time to give added strength to the entire dressing. Tie the liquid lace in at the same point as the new dub. and snip off the surplus. The wing case is made with the same material used for the tail, elk's fur. Choose a tuft and insert it points first into the hair stacker. By tapping the container repeatedly on the top of the workbench, the points of the fibers will line up. Tie in the tuft in the same way as the pheasant fibers, keeping in mind that later it will have to be bent forward. In this case, too, make sure the material is tied in really tightly to avoid unpleasant surprises later. Snip away the excess material. Bend the new dub back and tie it in. Then start winding it on to create the nymph's thorax, taking care that this part of the dressing does not cover the eye of the hook. A couple of tight winds of thread, and at last it's time to cut off the excess material. Now, bend the tuft forward, making sure it's stretched as far as possible. Tie it in with a few winds of thread. And then, instead of snipping off the excess, bend it back and tie it in. Two little tufts on each side of the nymph, arranging them so that they are angled slightly downwards. <laughs> 
First one, and then the other. And in the same way, arrange an even smaller tuft on top. Now cut away all surplus material and finish the dressing with the usual knot. These kinds of artificial nymphs are ideal for fishing in fast flowing waters or when used with floating line and long leader in lakes and reservoirs.